talk I have is, is quite a long talk, but I can always finish off with, on another occasion as Member's Corner or whatever, but it would be a pity to rush. Um, and as I proceed with this talk, you'll understand why. Okay, medical imaging's non-invasive um, imaging of the body, and doctors take some credit for it, but that's probably not correct. Because the people who really need to take credit are the physicists who have developed the techniques, the development of computer information technology, manufacturing companies, and I draw to your attention what is going to evolve because human beings are looking at the pictures. There's going to be surveillance imaging algorithms so that your breast mammogram or whatever will be screened by a human being who's worked out an algorithm and sorted out where the suspicious areas are. So that's really an evolution of the whole deal. Now, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about non-destructive imaging of the body. And for this talk, it's not going to include your skin observation, but that's extremely important for things like melanoma. Obviously, it's an office inspection. All holes get looked in. Everybody knows that. It's, a, it's sometimes joyful and sometimes not. I'm not going to comment. I'm not particularly commenting on retinal inspection. That's similar to looking in a hole. I'm not commenting on intrusive endoscopy that really is taking the world by storm in the mouth, up the anus, they meant in the middle somewhere. Similarly, you can have intrusive ultrasound. I'm not commenting on radiotherapy, and that's a big area. Clearly, there can be tumours inside, they can be targeted with imaging and specific ablative radiotherapy given. What I'm even talking about is imaging of internal anatomy from outside the body, where you can see structure, function, some of the biochemistry of the body, how glucose is used and those sorts of things. You can sometimes characterise the tissues, is it a tumour or not? You actually look at some tissue antigens and some disease characterization. All right, it's probably been going now for about 130 years since Ron in 1895 did experimentation with x-rays and saw that he could profile the internal structures of the body with x-rays. Now, I draw to your attention that light is about a wavelength of about 400 to 700 nanometers. A nanometer is one uh, thousand millionth of a, uh, of a meter rays were a lot smaller and they're more penetrating, they go through things. Um, there's differential absorption which is the key but they're also capable of ionisation so that there can, so, so that there can be internal damage. Um, we can administer different materials to outline the various parts of the body. Should stop breaking them bricks. Can you hear me with just my voice? Yeah. yeah. Okay, why don't I do that? Okay. I'll try this once more and then I'll go back to my voice. Can you hear that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll just leave this here so it doesn't make a noise. Look, there's a standard x-ray room. You can see that it's got a an x-ray generation machine. And, and it's got a means of detection. That's either going to be an X-ray film or electronic detecting plate. It can go in this direction when you're standing up or go downwards when you're having a supine X-ray. This is the general principle. You have the X-ray source here, which is a pin source. It then creates a, a shadow or profile of the body depending on how the tissues absorb the X-rays. So if it's going through the lungs, there'll be minimal absorption, going through the heart more so. If it's going through nothing, there won't be any absorption, so the x-ray plate will be darkened. Going through bones, essentially none being transmitted through it. <coughs> so it's dependent upon a point source and dependent upon the x-ray plate being close, close to the body. <coughs> the voltage that stimulates electrons are crashing into the tungsten target at 120,000 volts. These electrons are moving very quickly, about a third of speed of light. Now here's Carl Rongen in 1895. He won the first Nobel Prize in Physics. His third x-ray was that of his wife. He didn't patent it, and that was to his great credit. This here is was Marie Curie, or the Skodowska, that was her Polish name. She won two Nobel Prizes, one of them was to do with radiation, but she was applying x-rays for the purposes of on the front taking x-rays of soldiers who had been either fractured limbs or had bits of shrapnel inside of them. And she was truly a magnificent person. Two Nobel Prizes. Here's what modern x-rays can look like on the hand. The detail is exquisite. There's um, the growth plate in the distal radius. You can infer where the cartilage is by the de de 
difference where the bones are opposed. And you can see though that the soft tissues aren't well described. Clearly, when x-rays were first discovered, the utilization for fractures changed orthopedics and orthopedic care forever. This was a major advance. Clearly joints can be applied. This is a person who's got quite marked osteoarthritis in the right hip with then destructive um, geoformation within the bones. This other hip in five to 10 years will suffer the same. The femoral head is no longer, it's not spherical, hence it impinges on the outside margin of the hip. It's a gentleman down here. X-rays, looking at the lungs, clearly an application. Here's the heart profile and the pulmonary vessels. But being an airfield structure, there's not much attenuation. There's breasts here for a lady. And so you get a good idea about stuff that might be in the lungs. And here's an example of a pneumonia in the right middle lobe with a straight profile above. Excellent applications, things like TB pneumonia and lung tumours at a moderately advanced stage. It's also used for mammography, and this is where it's fortunate the breasts are largely fat occupied, so that tumours can, can highlight because they contain denser materials. In ladies with denser breasts, it can be a problem because the profiling of tumour, which is solid tissue against a dense background, makes them harder to see. But in this case, this speculated tumour is evident. There are further developments in mammography I can discuss a bit later. <laughs> this is a rather peculiar x-ray of the skull and it showed the application of x-rays of metal foreign bodies. This was a prisoner, not from Pentridge, but one of the US prisons. And his forte with his mates was banging nails into his head. So he'd get out there with his friends and say, look what I can do. He'd get a hammer and, and whack nails into his head. Oh. He, he didn't die with the first, the, the second, but the tenth one was sufficient to kill him and he ended up with um, infection in the brain and that led to his death. But, you know, clearly a good application for metal foreign bodies and a foolish prisoner. Well, that's all good and well. I've mentioned it there. It's great for bones and metal foreign bodies and for tissues where you can highlight <coughs> one tissue against another, but it's got major problems with soft tissues and hence CT scanning. You can see that here's a modern CT scanner, and the thing that is different here, it's a donut. So the person goes into the donuts, and x-rays are fired at the person from all directions. So it's fired from all directions and captured from all directions. And the principles of CT scanning are quite different to that of just a simple x-ray. And I've got this illustration here for you. Here's just an example of a, of a metal foreign body or a metal object in the field of view. If you fire x-rays like this, the x-rays will come along and darken the plate where there's no impingement of the metal. So you get a profile something like this. Similarly, if you fire them from this direction, you get a profile like this. What Hounsford and others got their Nobel Prize for was the following. It's called back projection. Knowing that's the pattern of absorption, if you fire, say, light through this profile, you get a profile that predominantly is a line like this, and from the other direction, predominantly a line like that. You put that together, you can work out the densest things in the middle. Clearly, using this model with just two projections, you get a square object. But if you take multiple projections, if you have an imaging or mathematical algorithm that corrects for this detail that isn't part of the original anatomy, you can come up with very good imaging. And so this is what, say, a CT scan looks like on soft tissue attenuation, where the slice goes from the top of the body through to about the upper chest. And so clearly now we have things like the thyroid, we have the musculature of the chest, the pectoral muscles anteriorly, muscles around the shoulder, a profile of the um, shoulder detail. Here's the vasculature, here's the aorta, and the vasculature within the mediastinum. But on this window, the lungs aren't particularly well shown. But this really revolutionised the teaching and understanding of anatomy. If you fiddle the dial, as one can with when you're fiddling with your digital imaging, you can highlight different tissues. So when I fiddle with, it's the same X-ray, or same CT sequence, but when I fiddle with the, with the dials, I can get up lung windows now. So I can now, in great detail, look at lung tissues and what might be there. Pneumonia, tumour, inflammation of other sort, and so on. It really was a major development. You can go into the abdomen, and you can see here we've injected iodized, iodized contrast 
which highlights some of the soft tissues, particularly those containing arteries and veins. So clearly here's a view of the heart, it's the left, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. A little bit of the left atrium here, and I'll come back to that. Given that we give it contrast, that highlights the tissues that are quite vascular. So here's both kidneys, but they've got these deficits in them. Here's the spleen over here in the left upper quadrant, and you can see that's got a deficit in it. This has come from emboli from the left atrium, and it's blocked off segmental supply to the kidneys. With modern imaging, you can, as well as the cross-sectional image in terms of the axial plane, you can reconstruct it because the pixels and voxels are quite small. So I can say, what plane do I want? One axial plane or a coronal plane? It's another development in how we might look at pictures. This is not the same person, but it shows us what we've discovered in the brain. Blood contains haemoglobin and it's dense in the adjacent tissues. So here's some anatomy of the brain. The brain's in two halves, and then it has a cerebellum. Here's the ventricles. If this ventricle is being squashed by a substantial hemorrhage within the substance of the right hemisphere. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage, blood vessels around the brain. One of them's burst, often from a berry aneurysm, and there's extensive blood in the subarachnoid space. And so there's a whole pattern of disease in the brain, particularly due to hemorrhage, that can be now highlighted. I'm just going through a range of the investigations and how they've evolved, and you all probably have had ultrasound, and it's really, again, another different but unique way of imaging internally the body. Clearly, animals use ultrasound or high-frequency sound, like bats fly without crashing into things in the cave, and animals, fish swimming in the ocean, and so on can also, the dolphins can work out where things are using high frequency sound transmission through water. Australia, in this area of imaging with ultrasound, had it with CSRA a fairly substantial development in, from 1959 onward. About 1956, there was obstetric ultrasound initially starting out in a very crude way, and not, not a lot of pictures, but just we knew that something was wrong. But then, in terms of clinical imaging, it was 1962 onwards, and this was really a major change in obstetric care. How many babies are there? What's their presentation? Reasonable centre? All this stuff was now known to the obstetrician. The principles of this is different. Um, it relates to the velocity of sound, and in water, the sound velocity is about 1,500 metres per second. In air, it's slower, and in denser tissues, it has a higher velocity. You're probably aware that when wave propagates from one medium to another, if there's a difference of flow, you can get reflection. And it's just reflection that's the key point in ultrasound. If the sound isn't transmitted through the tissues, it's also no good because you can't see beyond it. Hence, looking at the brain through the skull is limited, and if you have a whole lot of bowel gas, you can't see the structures deeper. This is the principle. And here's a transducer. You've all probably had ultrasounds, you know, they put some oil on you, or gel, that permits transmission that's efficient between the transducer and the skin. And it works on the basis that there's a number of elements to the transducer, and it tends to fire a beam of ultrasound. And it fires them out in sequence, as I've shown here, one, two, three, four, two, the number of components. It fires out a beam, and then it listens to the returning echo. If it hits, say, this anterior aspect of the liver, there's a echo point here. If it gets the back part, there's another echo point, it hits the kidney down here, another echo point. And it's the difference in time from when a pulse is sent out to when it's received that helps construct the image up here. So it's really tracking ultrasound pulses that go through the body. The pulses are quite discrete and you do one at a time as you're going along. So it's lots of very short pulses that end up giving rise to the image. And here's the example. Here's an early pregnancy with a yolk sac. You can actually look at differences due to movement, and here's the heart of this early pregnancy. And there's real, a, it's a real plethora of imaging now. In the, say, uh, this would be about a 32 week ultrasound, you actually see the baby, put the hand into the mouth, you work out the sex of the baby, you actually see fetal breathing movements for the baby. And the ultrasound people doing it now have a major headache. They have to tell the referring doctor and the mum with the baby, how many fingers it has. It has to in detail analyse the cardiovascular structures to make sure there's nothing abnormal, to make sure that the kidneys are normal, blah, 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 blah. It's like looking at the whole body in 20 minutes. It's a very difficult task. 
Okay, here's obviously a gallstone in the gallbladder. We've gone through the skin here, and you can see shadowing because this attenuates or stops further propagation of the, of the ultrasound through it. Well, you thought that was interesting and another use of our knowledge of physical things to get pictures inside the body. This is just about magic. It's the closest thing we have in medical imaging to magic. It's magnetic resonance imaging. This works in a very interesting way and the physics is um, most demanding. Um, you're aware of the atomic nature of the world where you have the nucleus and electrons around it. Electrons actually are responsible for bondage between one structure and another and really uh, the chemical nature of the world. But the nucleus has its own story. You know that you can have atom bombs and all those sorts of things from nuclear physics. But the nuclei have generally, they have lots of things in them, but simply described it can be protons and neutrons. And even though neutrons don't have a charge, they have a magnetic moment. And so does a proton. And with, and, and generally, if you're describing the atomic structure, you call the middle bit the nucleon. It's the combination of, nucle of nuclei, of the neutron and the protons. And if that happens to be an odd number, there's an unpaired magnetic moment. And so things like water, which contains hydrogen, just one hydrogen for most water, that has a magnetic property. Most magnetism is due to the behaviour of the electron cloud around mo molecules and atoms. There's a weaker magnetic moment related to the nuclei. And so that water has a magnetic property due to the protons within it. And so does fat containing protons. So these two structures in particular have discrete magnetic moments. This was originally worked up in about the 30s using to work out chemical bondage. It was just done with specimens in a test tube. And to convert this sort of imaging, this sort of technology to imaging has been a major development in the 80s, 90s and thereafter. So what I'm talking about here is that we have protons coming from, which is the charged bit in the nucleus. They're unpaired and they have a weak magnetic signal. To detect that magnetic signal, you need to put them in a very strong magnetic field so that it, they tend to gyrate. So if you've got a magnetic aspect like this and it's spinning, if you put a magnetic moment to it, it will align up a bit as best it can and then gyrate like a top. So that the sort of magnetic fields we use for MRI, which is one Tesla, about three, three Tesla. Now, one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. That's 10,000 times the magnetic strength of the Earth. So if you go into this environment and have something metallic, it'll be pulled away from you in most violent fashion. So this is a unique environment. There are many books on how it all works, but that's as much as you're getting today. So nuclei, unpaired protons, magnetic moment, high, extremely high magnetic field that really isn't found anywhere on Earth except in an MRI machine or alternatively in things like aluminium smelters that have had such high current flows yet high magnetic fields. This is what it looks like and you can see that it's not too dissimilar to the CT except that it's bigger, it's longer and you go in there and you're obviously checked out and have any metal on you or any electronic stuff that will be wrecked by the high magnetic field and it makes all sort of groaning noises in there and that's because the metal framework in here is influenced by the changing magnetic fields. These are the pictures. Wow, the sun has come up on the brain, has it not? Here's someone's eye. Here are the eyes here. But look how the brain is now shown. Here's the white matter showing a whiter colour than the cortex. The detail is exquisite. Here's the top bit of the cerebellum. Here's the brain stem in here. Here's some arteries. Here's the coronary arteries here. And here's the, uh, the basilar artery and the posterior cerebral arteries at the top. <coughs> Utterly exquisite. <coughs> Note though, the bones, because they contain calcium, don't have high protons, hence they are a void. And what we're looking in the middle here is the bone marrow in the bone, and that's fat in the skull. Well, pathology. Here's a person who's had a large right-sided cerebral infarct with swelling of the brain. This is a CT scan 
done in now the sagittal plane, and you can see the bone detail is pretty well shown. But we can't see the marrow portions of bone so well, nor on this window or other windows can we show the spinal cord. But look what the MRI machine does. They have all different imaging sequences. This is a T2 sequence that's showing up the fluid, that's the CSF space around the brain, around the spinal cord, and fat. And now we're highlighting, here's the bit of the brain stem here, bottom bit of the cerebellum, and so on. And here we have the spinal cord. Wow, this is fantastic anatomy. Here we have blobs in the bone. This was from, cerebral, this was from bone metastases. Were the bone metastases causing problem with the spine? No. It's a disc. This person's got disc disease that's causing this protuberance at this point. It's exquisite what we can now see. Okay, it's pretty fashionable now to have an anti ligament disruption. Here's a view in the sagittal plane as I'm slicing with a big knife. Here's a lower bit of the femur, top bit of the tibia, patella. Here's the cartilage of the patella, fat in the ground of the patella. Here's the cartilage up here. And this is the anti ligament here. If this is pushed forwards, and this gets disrupted, here's the posterior cruciate ligament. And here's one that's disrupted, slightly different imaging sequence, and that's blood in and around the knee. Hmm. Okay, so we've gone through profiling things with an X-ray from Carl Longan. <coughs> we've spoken a little bit about developing that technology with CT, different technology with ultrasound, looking at sound. What happens if the radiation or whatever is inside the person? Um, this is the nuclear medicine domain, and this came out of the use of iodine. Most iodine we ingest goes into the thyroid, and what you don't ingest or absorb is passed out in urine. So that, the, the use of radioactive iodine for treating overactive thyroiditis has been well known for quite a time. But then you can get pictures knowing that the iodine or whatever isotope you have that's similar to iodine will go to the thyroid. So this technology has been evolved to get pictures of the body and its organs and its function by injecting them with radioactive materials. That's evolved to positron emission tomography, which is another radioactive source. Um, positrons, as you may or may not know, are antimatter, and we normally have electrons and neutrons and all those, all those sorts of things, but after Einstein and others looked at it all, they said, well, look, why don't we have antimatter? So that, well, I was using positrons for purposes of diagnosis, cyclotron produced, fluorine 18 decays to give up positrons. Wow. The positrons have a short path length in the body, hit an electron, and then give radiation in two separate directions, opposed. Right, so just summarising what nuclear medicine is about, it's an internal radiation source for imaging and sometimes for treatment. The gamma rays, gamma rays come from nuclei and X-rays come from electron reorganisation, but they're similar in properties. They all, yeah. So this is how nuclear medicine works. The radioactive material, due to the fact that it's hooked up to some other molecule, might target the liver. That's commonly called a colloid. The liver likes to absorb colloid or junk. So this is a trace that's been injected into the liver. Gamma cameras are different in that you can't profile it. You've got to take a picture as a lens might take in a camera. But because the radiation is so penetrating, you can't use a lens structure, we use a collimator. So only X-rays or gamma rays coming in this direction go in. We have a thicker ionized crystal source and a means of detection to get a picture something like that. Okay, often the pictures aren't of great detail, but they show you something different. They show you function of the body. This is a dog that I sliced up with a diamond tipped microtome. We inject them with the bone tracer. You can see that the bone tracer isn't really outlining the cortical portions of bone, but the growing parts of bone that are in the trabecular structure of the bone. So really we understand now a bit of function and growth. If you inject stuff that's excreted or by the kidney, you can then work out and quantitate how much kidney function there is. These are pictures taken over a period of about eight minutes, and you can see the left kidney's got a certain degree of function that we didn't know beforehand, because this left kidney had a large calculus in it. We didn't know whether to take the kidney out or try and take out the stone and restore some function. It had sufficient function to deserve removal of the stone and not take out the entire kidney. This is positron emission tomography. This is fancy stuff. Um, and it relies 
the most commonly one is fluorodeoxyglucose. And this is um, taken up as glucose is by the body. So that the brain mainly uses glucose for its function. It takes up about 20% of the body's circulation. So this is the brain that's shown up when we inject fluorodeoxyglucose. One of the things I was doing when I was working with this was I we had the patients there and they were watching telly. Well, I could see who's watching telly by seeing whether that part of the brain that analyzes pictures was highlighting. So those that are watching telly, that part of the brain was lighting up. Very interesting. You can do various other studies and there's other ways of doing it when people are thinking of music, the musical bit lights up and so on. This is functional imaging, but in this person here who's got this mass in the left side of chest, this is an invasive chest tumour, and these blobby bits down here represent spread, and this is a normal excretion of the glucose. So you've got to understand a bit of normal anatomy and function. I'll probably stop today as this is my last picture just showing imaging alone. I can come back and talk about um, radiation exposure and risks, and I can talk a bit more about other things, but this is the final one. And this is a picture of me. This is my um, right macula. The eye works a bit like this. It's, it's got the anterior chamber with fluid in it, clear fluid. It's got gel type material in the main chamber and it's got the optic <coughs> nerve. And here it's got the macula, which has finest vision and it's got rods. So it's the finest vision of the eye and colour vision. And the macula works a bit like this. This is the detecting frame called the cones, called the rods, I should say, the macula. And then the nerves come out of that and they spread around. So the nerves that exit the detection of light don't actually impinge light coming in. So the macula's thinned out at this, the, the retina's thinned out here, that's called the fovea. But the exquisite nature of this is that this point on a histological picture, that's 0.1 of a millimetre. This is 0.1 of a millimetre, that's 0.1 of a millimetre. With this technology, we can just about, we can show nerve layers in the retina. And this is a non-invasive way of showing that with exquisite resolution. This is, main, this is if you're going to have fancy ophthalmology, this is what they do to you. And uh, it operates that you have light being shone in the eye, it's uh, ultra, it's at the infrared spectrum. And it then, they use an interference pattern with half the light transmitted under one sort of interferometer, another half that goes in here and is reflected back. This is another application of this sort of fancy physics and imaging technology. I'll stop there because that's a fair bit of information to give to you. Um, I provided some illustrations uh, and as I said earlier the doctors take some credit and are very proud of what they can do with it but the people who really made the major contribution here are the physicists, the industry and those who use it. So thank you for your time. <laughs>